Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. So good to see so many here in our sanctuary today, and it is a joy to open the Word together. I asked Pastor Chris to read really about the first half of the chapter. I think most of you perhaps know the story of Nebuchadnezzar. This is the same Nebuchadnezzar that uh, Daniel has served for a while. Uh, there are certainly parallels between this chapter and chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that troubled him. In that case, Daniel had to tell not only the interpretation, he had to tell the dream. But in this one, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, who is in his glory, he has conquered really the known world. His kingdom is a great kingdom. His famous hanging gardens of Babylon are a sight to behold, one of the wonders of the ancient world. And yet in the middle of that, with all of his glory, with all of his might, he's troubled by what he sees in his own mind. You know, I, I believe that the, the moment in life where one sort of realizes this, this is as good as it gets is a really critical moment. Can I just tell you, after 40 years of ministry, I've seen people really mishandle that moment. A woman who is married to a good man, he loves her. He's not the most exciting guy in the world, but she reaches that age and that stage where she realizes, you know, I'm, I look about as good as I'm going to look, and it's all downhill from here. And she misses the attraction to another man. She misses being pursued, if you will. Well, the way she handles that moment, it's going to set the course of the rest of her life. And frankly, sometimes people, well, if you'll just allow me to use a vernacular term, I don't mean this in any diagnostic way, no technical sense at all, but I'll just say they go a little crazy. They just sort of forget themselves. They forget what they've always known and believed, and they go off into sin. And here's some man, and he's worked hard his whole life, and he's had a very, very faithful wife, and she's enabled him to do the things that he's done. But now that he's achieved a certain status, and he has a lot of money in the bank and it occurs to him that his life is short and it's limited and he decides he's going to use the resources that this faithful woman helped him obtain in order to pursue sin and he just goes a little crazy now i could tell you story after story after story and I've seen that happen not one time, but many times, variations of it. People very, very close to me have, they reach that moment where they sort of look around and they survey of what they have and what they've accomplished and who they are. And they are crazy enough to think that they accomplished it, that they achieved it, that somehow the very purpose of all that they have and all that they are is so that they might consume it on themselves. Well, that was precisely the moment where Nebuchadnezzar was. Now, God has been gracious to Nebuchadnezzar. You can read in the history of the Old Testament how many kings came against Israel that even if God used them to punish his people, even if he used them to defeat his people so that they might learn something, it might drive them back to him, he still dealt very harshly with those enemies of his people. And yet here, Nebuchadnezzar, God has established in a great way. Nebuchadnezzar has destroyed Jerusalem and defiled God's temple and taken away the furniture that was in there that all was to portray God's coming Messiah. So if there's anybody that God would be completely just in judging, it would be this guy. And yet, God has been gracious He's been so gracious that he's given him of the young men that he has conquered, like Daniel. Why, he's spoken wisdom into his life. 
He has extended his kingdom. He has shown him that grace. God even gave him that vision in which God really laid out for Nebuchadnezzar his plan for all of the future. And he told Nebuchadnezzar, there are going to be kingdoms that will come after yours. But of all earthly kingdoms, yours is the chief. You are the golden head on that statue. And only when there comes a, a rock that is cut out of the mountain without hands and it destroys all the kingdoms of this world, only then will there be a kingdom greater than yours. And God has shown him favor. And yet, as Nebuchadnezzar walks around Babylon, as he is on his roof surveying all that is his, it, it, it occurs to me in the Old Testament, kings get in trouble when they walk around on their roofs. Have you noticed that? But Nebuchadnezzar surveys all that he sees and it, it, he does not stop to think of his kingdom in light of the great kingdom. He does not take the time to think that there is a stone that is coming that is going to absolutely demolish the kingdoms of this world and that I obedience to, to that God. Now, he, he certainly gives certain lip service to this God. I mean, you, you see how this chapter begins. That Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he's writing this, uh, and I believe he... This is Daniel recording for us what Nebuchadnezzar's decree was. And he acknowledges the signs and wonders that this most high God has done for him. How great are his signs, how, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Now one might wonder, does, is this what Nebuchadnezzar thought and said prior to this dream and its fulfillment? Or is this his introduction to the dream and fulfillment? Either way, we know this, that in chapter 2, God has extended his grace in Nebuchadnezzar and told him what's coming. And, and it, it really doesn't have an impact on Nebuchadnezzar's behavior. His, he knows the truth. He just doesn't act on that truth. And while he is, what a phrase, at ease in my house and prospering in my palace, well, there, that's that dangerous moment. You know, he knows a lot, doesn't he? But knowledge without wisdom is arrogance. It's just arrogant to think that you achieved anything. It's arrogant to think that somehow you deserve the breath you're drawing right now. It's arrogant to think that somehow you had anything to do with the mind that God gave you. It's arrogance to think that any little thought has popped into your tiny little human brain that has not occurred to the God who created you. It's, it's arrogant to think that you have anything in your bank account that could possibly add to God's riches and glory. It's arrogant to think that you are anything, that you have achieved anything apart from the grace of God. It is all of his grace. And so Nebuchadnezzar, thinking that he knows what he's done, at ease in his palace, he, he has knowledge, but he has no wisdom. And so God, God teaches and the lessons God teaches are always precisely appropriate to our needs of education, aren't they? Well, I can look back through my life at the times that I just began to believe a little something about myself, that I was smart or accomplished or good at something. And, you know, the Lord just has a way of just knocking the wind out of you every now and then. It's never pleasant. Uh, you, never, you never want it. But the Lord has a way of teaching you what you need to know. A and he's going to do that with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has great power. At this point, he's the most powerful man in the world, quite literally. But, but power without restraint 
is oppression. And he's not using his power for good. He's not using his power to help people. He's using his power to further his own ends, his own purposes. So God weakens. You know, it, it, it occurs to me that a lot of times we think we have power. We, we just count on the force of our limbs, the, the, the strength of our bodies, the, the abilities of our minds. We think because we've all, we've ever had it, we'll always have it. You know, that's just not so. The, just one tiny little thin spot in a blood vessel in your brain. And an aneurysm can end it all. You can lie down to go to bed at night, and in the middle of the night, there can be a heart attack, a stroke. I mean, so many things that would if they don't end your life completely, will absolutely change it in just a moment. I mean, how foolish are we to take for granted our abilities, our strengths, our, our possessions? And a lot of times, if we have not yielded all that we are and all that we have to God and said, Lord, my purpose is to bring honor and glory to you. The purpose for which I live the reason I breathe is that I might exalt and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. If you begin to make it about you, if you begin to look at your life and say, well, boy, this is about as good as it gets. I, I better make hay while the sun shines. I, I better get all the pleasure I can get. I better do what I want to do. Then you're perhaps in for a very brutal lesson. God teaches and God weakens in order to tell you that if you're using your powers without restraint, without seeing that God ultimately is the author of that power and its, its very purpose is to bring glory to him, then you're simply oppressing people. You're not using it for good. You're using it for you, and that's dangerous. And you look at all your goods, you look at your bank account, you, you look at your house, or houses, your car or cars, your boat, whatever you have. Possession without gratitude is entitlement. Well, it's easy for you to begin thinking that somehow you deserve that stuff. You'll say things like, well, I've worked hard for this. You know, I, frankly, as a pastor, I've seen this many times. I've seen people that were faithful to the Lord they were here week in and week out every time the doors were open and they were working hard to rear their children and to build a life. And, you know, after a while, salary increases, kids move out, and now suddenly you got discretionary money and, well, boy, it'd be good to have a lake house and they buy a lake house and maybe they miss one week, uh, one Sunday a, a month and the next is two. And, and then before you know it, you've not seen them for years. Possession without gratitude is entitlement. You, you somehow feel like you're entitled to these things, that you're entitled to this life. And when you begin to feel entitled, you know what God does? God takes. He says, let's, let's see if you can learn the lesson that I'm worth your service and your obedience and your faithfulness whether or not I give you stuff. And this is precisely what he does with Nebuchadnezzar. The only way Nebuchadnezzar can learn his role and his place is for God to take it away for a while. So the Lord causes Nebuchadnezzar, while he's surveying all he has, while he's feeling rather accomplished at his conquest and his construction, God sends him a, a message by way of watchers. I assume those are angels. I don't know if you noticed that word that sort of jumps out at me, uh, but through the, the medium of these watchers, they, they make this decree to Nebuchadnezzar in his dream. He doesn't quite understand what it means, but he knows who to send for. 
His wise men, they can't tell him. And he recalls the events of chapter two where no one else could tell him the dream, let alone the interpretation. And so now he sends for Belteshazzar, Daniel is his Hebrew name. And he tells him the dream. And did you notice, man, Daniel's afraid to tell him the interpretation. Daniel, it's like he turns white. The, the, the text, I believe, says that uh, Daniel was alarmed. He was dismayed. His, his thoughts alarmed him. He, and he says, now, king, he said, oh, may the interpretation be for your enemies. What a diplomatic way of saying this, this is not good. <laughs> it would be far better if this dream were about your enemies, but it's not. It's about you because you have become your enemy. While you are pursuing the good, you have failed to get the best. And God is going to cause something awful to happen in your life. He, he describes it. For seven seasons, some translations say years, but the, the word here in Hebrew or in Aramaic is simply the word for seasons. It could be a year. It could be some other cycle of time. But he says for seven seasons, you're going to be like a beast of the field. You're, you're going to lose your reason. You're going to be like an animal. And you're going to do this till seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the most high rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Now, Nebuchadnezzar should know this. God's already given him a, one vision and told him that he's in complete control of all of world history. Past, present, future, he's told him what's coming. He knows that there's going to be an everlasting kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar, you should see that this kingdom of yours on this earth, as great as it is now, it's nothing compared to the king and the kingdom who is to come. And you should rule today in light of that kingdom then. It should change everything, but it, it is not. You're going to have to learn that God is the one who sets up kings and deposes them. It's God who gives the kingdom to whom he will, even, even to the simplest of men. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. He says, you know, your only hope here is to use what God has given you to bless others, to, to practice righteousness, to, to take burdens off of people. Oh, oh, dear friends, I just can't emphasize this enough. It should be your goal in life to be the kind of person that is taking burdens off of people instead of the kind of person that's putting burdens on. That when you look at your intellect or your accomplishment or your possessions. You ask yourself, how am I using this for the kingdom? How am I using this to bless people? And Nebuchadnezzar hears this message from Daniel and it really changes nothing. We're told in verse 28, all this came upon Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, as he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. Here, he's descending into that crazy moment. Look what I have done. I've done great stuff and I've done it for me. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken the kingdom has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know 
that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately, the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. Okay, now, Nebuchadnezzar gets corrected by the Lord, but there's something missing. He's no longer proud like he was. He's, he's no longer claiming what he claimed. In fact, his reason has left him completely. He's pretty much just thinking where the next meal comes from. He's in subsistence living, and his subsistence is that of an animal, which should teach us that correction without relationship is just humiliation. If God is gracious to rebuke you and to correct you, then you need to make sure that your response to that correction is to seek a deeper relationship with him. You know, too often what happens when we mess up, when we face the consequences of our own hubris and pride and arrogance, our goal becomes how can I get back to where I was? And that should be the last thing you want. Your goal should be, how can I have a relationship with the Lord? See, God's will for you is not a map. It's a relationship. It's not that you need so much to know exactly what your next step is going to be, but who's in charge of your next step. And Nebuchadnezzar has to get there. God takes his reason away from him. Now, I will tell you, you, when you read liberal commentaries on Daniel, they totally discount this. There's some later king of Babylon that, that does record a certain similar thing where he loses the kingdom for a while, and liberal scholars will say, this is talking about them, not Nebuchadnezzar. There's no, there's no record that Nebuchadnezzar ever lost the throne. Well, first of all, who's writing the history? And Nebuchadnezzar is writing the history because he's the king, and it's very, very understandable why this was not included in his secular history of his reign or his successors. But, uh, you know, I, I just believe the Bible. I believe that is, it happened exactly as it says here. And God taught Nebuchadnezzar, and he taught him the hard way. At first, he gave him correction, but it was correction without relationship, and that, that's just humiliation. You might be doing the right things after you've been humbled, but if you aren't walking with Christ, you've simply experienced humiliation, not holiness. I mean, I cannot tell you how often this happens that I, in, I deal with pa pastors who fall into sin. And one of the first questions they'll ask me is they'll say, do you think I can ever pastor again? And I tell them, man, I, I'm worried about you for even asking the question. That can't be your question. Wh how quickly you can get back up on the pulpit shouldn't even be on your mind. Your question is, how can I honor Christ? Uh, I, I, I've seen it when when our goal becomes to get back what we had or to, to sort of overcome the, the reputation that we lost or uh, to achieve some status that we once enjoyed, all you're doing is proving, proving that you have not really heard what God is saying in your life. When God allows you to fall into a period of humiliation, of craziness, of great loss. You have to see that your goal is to not be restored to some activity or to some possession or to some position, but your goal has to be to be restored to him. Look at verse 34. Nebuchadnezzar gets this. He says, at the end of the days, I Nebuchadnezzar lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. 
For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will, according among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? God restores. And when God restores, he restores us not to the thing we lost necessarily. He restores us to him. Tanya and I, Friday night, led, a, uh, they called it a date night uh, at uh, a large church in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we had a marvelous time and just got to talk about marriage and the way God works in a Christian marriage. And, you know, Tanya and I are real. We, you know, we let people know the struggles we've had. Wherever you are in your marriage, man, we've been there. If your marriage is bad, we've been there. If it's okay, we've been there. And if it's great, we're there most of the time. But when, when we share at churches like that, sometimes people are stunned to hear that a preacher and his wife ever have struggles. And I said, well, you know, we're just fallen and broken like everybody else. We, we have the same struggles because we've got the same flesh. And it's easy to sort of fall into the same pattern of pride that you see here in Nebuchadnezzar. And we, we shared all this Friday night and afterward, so this fellow came up to me and he said, man, my wife and I were sitting there kicking each other, uh, each other under, under the table saying, boy, this, this is us, this is us, we've been there. And I said, well, tell me your story. He said, well, he said, we separated. I had to move into a trailer for a year and a half. Couldn't see her or the kids. And he said, all because of my sin and my selfishness. And we weren't sure we were ever going to get back together. He said, but when I just began to turn it over to the Lord, when I began to seek him, when that became my goal instead of just getting my marriage back, he said, something really significant happened. See, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about. You've got to stop making about what you lost in position and power and prestige and possessions and make it about your relationship to Christ. See, the goal, the motive for being obedient, for being holy is based on that relationship. See, discipline says, oh, I need to. Duty says, I ought to. But devotion says, I want to. I don't want to use my life, my possessions, my position for me. I want it to bring honor and glory to Christ. And when you get there, then you can say, Lord, if you want me to rule over Babylon, then I will rule to your glory. And if you want me to just live day to day from an unseen treasury that you feed me by your hand. I will do it for your honor and your glory. And when you see the grace of God at work in your life, you want to. Now listen, God might let you go a little crazy to restore you to true sanity. I've been pastor here long enough. I know an awful lot of stories in this room. And frankly, you know mine. And we fall into similar patterns. We get full of ourselves. We get, we feel entitled. We, we look around ourselves and say, well, this is as good as it's going to get. And I better do what I can now to get pleasure, to get power, to get prestige. But when you come face to face with the fact that it is God who rules sovereign in the affairs of humanity, that he works in our lives according to his pleasure and his plan, that he sets up who he wills, he, he de debases who he wills, he, he grants gifts to whom he wills, that it's all for his glory. And you say, Lord, all I want is to bring glory to the Lord Jesus. Then you begin to know who you are. And you really know what you have. 
and you begin to know your place in God's plan. And most of all, you know who God is and what he has done for you. So I ask you to look at what God's brought you through. I imagine you're like me, most people I know, there's been some crazy cycles in your life. You've made bad decisions. You've felt entitled. You've used what you have and who you are for your glory rather than God's. My question to you is, okay, so what about now? Where are you today? Isn't the Lord gracious? And that he does not hold against us our past. We've all blown it. We've blown it many ways and many times. And yet God is so good and so gracious that he says that if you'll come to me now, come to me today, you're, you're, you're weary and heavy laden with all of your own efforts and trying to be good enough and, and be proud enough. And he says, just come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. That's what I need. I need rest. And that's what it is to grow in grace. And if you aren't growing in grace, then you'll be living in disgrace. Do you know that if you come to God with all of your brokenness, with all of your craziness, whatever bad decisions you've made and what your life represents, and you just say, Lord, I want you to take this and use it for your glory. I, I put no demands on you. I'm not asking you for anything other than for Jesus to be exalted in my life. And that is when incredible things begin to happen. Because that is the number one desire of the Holy Spirit, to exalt Jesus Christ. And when your desires line up with the desire of the Holy Spirit, an incredible thing will happen in your life. Can, is it even thinkable? that you would pray to God and say, Lord, my greatest desire is for my life to bring glory to Jesus. And him say, no, nope, won't do that. No, I'll let you do anything else, but I won't let you glorify Jesus. That is unthinkable. You might want a lot of other things God will say no to, but when you begin to call on heaven and say, I want to bring glory to Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes notice and says, I'll help you do that. Maybe he'll restore to you some of the things that you once had. Maybe not. But I know this. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul is telling the Philippians how to have the mind of Christ, how to have unity. And here's what he says. He says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Who? Who? And the most glorious truths hang on that relative pronoun. Who, though being in the form of God, didn't consider his equality with God something to grasp at, something to cling to. But he emptied himself. And he took upon himself the form of a servant. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Do, do you see what Jesus did? He didn't walk across the roof of his heavenly palace saying, look what I've got, what I've done. I'm going to cling to this. No, Jesus who would be the one being who would be entitled to do such a thing, instead lays it aside. Why? To become a human and being found in fashion as a man, he empties himself and humbles himself and takes upon himself the form of a servant and not just any servant. I mean, the lowest servants, he becomes obedient to the point of death and not just any death, the death of the cross. And then Paul says, wherefore? For this reason, because 
he emptied himself and humbled himself and became obedient even to death, the death of the cross. Because of this downward progression, God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God that Jesus is Lord. Now look, God might elevate you. He might exalt you in due time. And when you can trust him so much that whether he allows you to lose or to win, whether he allows you to be empty or full, whether he allows you to be debased or exalted, all that matters to you is that you bring glory to Jesus. That's when you really will know grace because elevation, when God exalts you, when he elevates you, elevation without pride is grace. But if God can't trust you with his exaltation, with his elevation, then you're going to be in for some rough times. God exalted Jesus, but only after he endured the suffering. You can't get to the crown except through the cross. You, you can't have the exaltation without the humiliation. This is why Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he might exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. You say, oh, but if I don't clutch and grasp and if I, I don't get it, what will happen? Uh, my life will fall apart. You, you just throw your care upon Jesus. You cast your care upon him about that because he cares for you even more than you care for yourself. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in the faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Oh, when God elevates you in his time for his purpose, for his glory, and you can respond saying, Lord, it's just all about you, that's grace. And that is why God saves. He saved you so that he might elevate you even to the very throne of heaven. God may let you have possessions or prestige or power or personality, but if your life is based on those things, you're in for a world of hurt and humiliation. But when you come broken before the Lord in the knowledge of, uh, the knowledge of your own sinfulness and weakness and cast yourself completely on him, then he can take your brokenness and make something meaningful of your life. Like Nebuchadnezzar, your little story is a part of God's great story. Your little kingdom is one day going to be demolished by a king and a kingdom that is coming. But don't wait till then. Come before him now in humility, repenting of sin, calling upon him for salvation, desiring to bring glory to him because the rock that will one day shatter the nations has to first shatter you.